Good afternoon, and uh, thank you all for coming for this special lecture. Our speaker today is Professor Charles Harvey of MIT's Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Uh, he's here for a couple days. He's also giving the biogeochemistry seminar uh, tomorrow at 4 down in Corson Hall, uh, Morrison Room. But we talked him into giving a second talk uh, today. Uh, Charlie has uh, a Bachelor of Arts degree from Oberlin College in Mathematics, and he earned Master's and a PhD from Stanford. His PhD is in Geological and Environmental Sciences. He's got very broad research interests, and tomorrow he's going to be talking about his work on, on uh, uh, tropical uh, forests in Borneo and carbon storage in those. He's got a background in hydrology as well as biogeochemistry. Also works on arsenic contamination in Bangladesh and Vietnam. Works on coastal groundwater systems. But he's an expert on carbon sequestration as well. And that's the talk that we've asked him to give today. He's very well known for his uh, critical thinking about carbon sequestration. And so I'm really delighted that we could talk him into this. Uh, we'll have, I think, time for some questions uh, at the end. And uh, for those of you who are wondering, this is not live on Zoom. You've got to be here totally. But we are filming it to try to make it available later. So with that, uh, Charlie, all yours. Thanks. OK, well, thanks for having me. And thanks to Bob for hosting this. It's, uh, it's thrilled to be here. Um, and it's, uh, it's an unusual talk for me. I, I have given something like this a couple times before. But my talks are usually science talks. So I'll put a plug in for the one I'm doing tomorrow, which is a conventional science talk about, uh, about, uh, about Borneo. Um, I'm going to talk about the policy and economics, largely, of carbon capture and sequestration in a very critical vein. So I'll warn you of that. Um, it, I have published a number of papers on the topic, but uh, much of my thinking comes out of the experience of being part of a company, a startup company, uh, 15 years ago to do this. And it was successful in the sense that um, we raised a lot of capital, over $200 million. Um, and we, we did that um, with a pitch you know, that often kind of went like this, is that power generation is the largest source of CO2 emissions. Um, and carbon capture and sequestration is the least expensive means to abate that. Um, at the time, uh, I think it was, we were a little bit on the edge of that being true. Um, but there was uh, uh, optimism about, it's hard to imagine now, a bipartisan bill uh, and cap and trade. And there was you know, thought that we would want to abate this. So our idea was to be in the, um, in the position to do that. Um, the company, as far as I'm concerned, failed. And it, it failed for the simple reason that the cost of renewable energy and energy storage just kept plummeting. So it was just a matter of, of four or five years after we started the company that we couldn't honestly pitch it that way anywhere for any, any source of carbon that we could find. Now, the company continued to exist as an enhanced oil recovery company, which is what almost all carbon capture and sequestration is. For a while, then the, the price of oil dropped. And I think that went bankrupt as basically all the other carbon capture and sequestration then, because it was all enhanced oil recovery. Um, now, the way I'm going to kind of organize the talk today is around this mystery to me and to my colleagues from those days of why are we talking about it in the last year so much? Why has this come back? The competition has continued to improve. Um, it's, in, you know, it's, a, it's literally a tenth the cost for solar and wind energy now than it was 15 years ago when we started this. Um, so I want to talk about a couple reasons. One is just the very obvious reason that there was huge government subsidies. The Infrastructure Act of, what was that, a year or two years ago, um, direct subsidies to build carbon capture and sequestration. And then particularly um, in the, uh, the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, which is largely a climate bill, um, 
a big increase in what's called the 45Q subsidy. And this is a subsidy for every ton of CO2 injected into the ground, kind of regardless for use. So these subsidies are now um, $85 a ton. If you do something that's just really not done, just inject it in the ground to sequester it. $60 per ton if you use it for enhanced oil recovery. And then something that we never took seriously, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, but, but is getting a lot of attention and government money now, is for carbon capture sequestration that's connected to direct air capture. So this is pulling the very dilute CO2 out of the atmosphere, much more expensive than actually taking it out of emissions from a smokestack. These subsidies are now 130 tons. Um, oh, this is backwards. So 130 tons, uh, $130 per ton for EOR and 180 for direct sequestration, which is just mind blowing if you've worked in this field in the past. That's a lot of money per ton of CO2. Um, Another reason uh, that we're talking about this a lot is that it subsidizes both natural gas production, which I don't think a lot of people appreciate, and of course oil production through enhanced oil recovery, which uh, more people appreciate. And then uh, yet another reason is that there is a long history of very optimistic projections that this entire industry of carbon capture sequestration is going to get really big really soon. Um, and I'll talk more about that. And then I'm actually going to end by talking about something that uh, is a little, a little controversial, but I'll dive into it. And that is that oil companies fund tremendous, well, basically all of the engineering academic work on carbon capture and sequestration. So let me start uh, talking about the subsidies. And to do that, let me look at all of the existing operating right now carbon capture and sequestration projects. So these are the ones that are getting subsidies right now through the 45Q. Um, and there's 12 of them. Actually, there's 13 of them. I just learned about one really tiny new one, but it's not that. So there's 12 of them. Uh, they're um, all over the country. Um, and they get their carbon dioxide. Oh, where's my laser thing I should use? Oh, okay. They get their carbon dioxide. Um, so let me do this without getting in front of you guys. Uh, the carbon dioxide from a variety of sources. Um, but the, the thing I want to point out is that the majority of it comes from natural gas production. So this is carbon dioxide that's not produced by burning fossil fuels or doing any kind of industrial work like that. This is geologic millions of years old carbon dioxide that's pumped to the surface and then has to be removed from the methane to make the methane of sufficient grade to sell as natural gas. So that's where most of it comes from. And where does most of it go to? Well, there's one uh, ethanol plant that puts it underground just to store it. So it's the plant that produces about four, ton, uh, four megatons of CO2 per year. They meant to inject one megaton per year. They've only ever achieved half a megaton. So they emit three and a half and inject half a megaton underground. All the rest of the projects do enhanced oil recovery with it. So that's basically where it goes. You'll see in the literature a lot of times CCUS, carbon capture use and storage. That is the only U. Uh, there isn't really a huge need of it to like carbonate beverages or anything. And um, on average, this amounts to about a $30 subsidy per barrel of oil produced. Um, so the point I want to make here is that most of the carbon capture and sequestration subsidizes both the production of natural gas, right, because that's where you're getting it from, and the uh, production of oil, because that's what you're using it for. OK, now what I want to do is talk about a couple of these specific programs, you know, or pr specific projects. And I'm going to start with this one in Michigan uh, called Core Energy, not because it's particularly large, um, but because it's just sort of useful. And it's one that claims, there's quite a bit of literature on this, to actually create net negative emissions. So I want to look at that claim and analyze what that means. They also produce a lot of really nice graphics that I can use to explain um, how the whole system works. So if we zoom in on their graphics, the way the system works is that you've got 
shale gas being produced that has carbon dioxide in it. It goes to the processing plant, where a lot of energy is used to separate the CO2 from the, uh, from the methane. There's actually, has to, there's actually a whole methane burning plant associated with that. The methane then goes off to be used. Some people at Cornell might claim that some of it leaks. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. OK. And then the, the CO2 comes over here and gets compressed. It has to be compressed to the hydrostatic pressures deep underground. That also takes a lot of energy, because that, so actually methane is burnt there. It's injected into the ground. And then I think I still, so it goes deep underground. Um, it's pushed through to another well. Oil um, and CO2 are miscible. So all these little teeny pockets of oil stuck in the rock mixed with the CO2. Uh, the whole thing is pumped out, comes back up to the surface. And um, the idea is then that the CO2 is cycled back around again. Um, and of course, you produce oil, which goes off to refinery and to be used. So um, how is this possibly a, uh, uh, a good thing? How does this possibly result in, uh, in negative emissions? So the basic answer is no, it doesn't at all. If you're in the atmosphere looking at what's coming, there is nothing in this entire project that pulls greenhouse gases of any kind out of the atmosphere. There's no negative possible. Um, but there's a lot of different emissions. Um, so how do, they, how do they get to this claim? Well, here's the accounting. Um, the idea that they did, it's, it's, the, the reason I use this is they did a very careful job at least as far as I know, of sort of adding everything up and figuring out in this part of the life cycle where it all comes from, uh, where it all comes and goes. So you've got a, um, a power plant to power the CO2 separation from the natural gas processing plant. And it produces about half a megaton of CO2. And then you've got a compression to inject it into the oil field. It produces another three or 400 uh, kilotons. Um, and then you've got uh, downstream, they actually accounted for the burning of the oil that you produce. That's how much CO2 you get from consumption of the oil. So if you add all that up together, um, you get, well, about two megatons of emissions coming from it. But in order to drive this whole thing, they injected about two megatons as well. They injected a little bit more, so it actually comes out to net negative. Right? This is kind of convincing. This was a real head scratcher for me when I first read the paper. And it's like, oh, this is how it works. So what they just did was add up the CO2 produced for separation, compression, and oil burned, and said, oh, it's about the same as what, it, what went in for injection. What it, this sort of life cycle analysis doesn't recognize is that the gas processing plant produced exactly this amount. right? So they produce basically one unit. They put one unit in, back into the ground, and they produce another unit in doing this. Um, so again, from the atmosphere, what you see is one unit coming up into the atmosphere. And that's not even touching uh, the methane produced. When it's burned, it turns into CO2. And some people think some of it might, might leak as well. <laughs> so it doesn't even account for that. Um, OK. So let me move on to the sort of the big, the big kahuna, the big uh, carbon capture and sequestration site, the biggest one in the world that's been operating for 40 years. So it's operating long before anyone cared about subsidizing things for climate change because it's a big um, uh, enhanced oil recovery project. So this is the Exxon project. It's called either Chute Creek or Labarge project. Um, and uh, what it does is they pump out gas. Now, this is geologic, ancient gas. Been down there for, oh, I forget. But you know, tens of millions of years here. It's about 2 thirds CO2, about a fifth methane. And then importantly, it has a little bit of very valuable helium as well. So that gas is pumped out. The methane is separated and sold. The helium is separated and sold. And over the, the lifetime of the project, we think 
that about half of the gas, 120 megatons, has just been vented to the atmosphere when the price of oil is low. When the price of oil is high, it's used for enhanced oil recovery. And the other half has gone to that, with a little smidgen in here put into the ground for not enhanced oil recovery. Remarkably, 120 megatons is exactly what Exxon claims in their advertisements for the amount of carbon that they've removed, abated from the atmosphere. So I think basically the whole, the whole, uh, whole Exxon thing comes from that. And what they're not saying there is that they also put 120 megatons into the atmosphere, right? This actually makes burning the natural gas from this site worse than burning coal by adding up the CO2 before you even consider all of these other sources of emissions. The emissions that are created to power the whole thing, what's kind of called the energy penalty, um, or the emissions from burning the oil or from burning the natural gas. So I'd argue that the Chute Creek uh, project is actually sort of one of the biggest greenhouse gas disasters that I know, yet it is subsidized as a, uh, as, as a project to fight climate change. Exxon is now uh, lobbying to increase those subsidies and is planning to increase the size of this site. OK, so last one, and I, I could talk about this the whole, the whole time, uh, but I don't want to do that. This was not on that diagram because it doesn't exist yet. But a remarkable thing happened just a couple weeks ago is the Department of Energy gave $1.2 billion for direct air capture. Um, a big chunk of that goes to Occidental Petroleum, um, who operate most of the enhanced oil recovery in the Permian Basin in western Texas. I don't know exactly how they're going to operate all that. This funding was given to them, as far as I can tell. I can't find any like, plan or proposal for what they're going to do. But here's some old proposals they had. So, Well, actually, it's kind of interesting. So what have they been doing? So this is what they're saying is they're, they want to move from this to this. So conventional EOR is that you pump up, just pump up CO2. So this is where most of the CO, industrial CO2 comes from. You just pump it up from a reservoir of CO2. You inject it into oil reservoir, you produce oil, right? So what they want to do is they want to pump up natural gas, burn that to power uh, air capture, um, and then you know, follow the same thing. But the, their argument is, well, in this air capture, we pull in a lot of the CO2 that's produced from burning the oil. They don't talk about the CO2 that comes from powering the whole, you know, all, all of this. Um, this is where I could talk about this for a long time, but I don't want I think, to. I think I can kind of convince you pretty quickly why this is sort of shocking, and, and, and it's because the thermodynamics are just so bad, right? Uh, we're worried about CO2 in the atmosphere at what is it, 0.04% now, because it causes greenhouse gas warming. But that's still a, almost like a trace gas in the atmosphere. It's very expensive to remove a small amount of gas mixed with a lot of gas. There is nowhere, no conceivable reason why you would do this as long as there's a smokestack anywhere on Earth emitting CO2, right? You would just plumb that into your direct air capture and wouldn't have to burn nearly as much natural gas to power the, power the whole thing. So there's a lot more to be said about it, but what's sort of astounding to me is this is moving forward and then they also can get the $180 Q45 subsidy um, for injecting that. Okay, so move on to the second of sort of the four reasons why we're still talking about this. Um, and that is these uh, projections that have been going on for a long time that there's going to be a lot of this. Um, so what I'm plotting here is reduced CO2 emissions. So basically how much CO2 has been injected into the ground over time. The dark line is what exists. So we're up to about 40 megatons per year now. The US is half of it. The 20 I just showed you is half of the global sequestration. And then I want to go back in time and look at how past projections of the future sort of march through time and predict what the future is going to be. And so 2004, 2006, 2007, you go along like this. Um, and the point I want to make here is that past projections uh, were wrong, very optimistic, and the current projections, the most recent ones, um, are, the, are the same. 
um, very optimistic. I should also point out here, I put 40 megatons here, but it's almost all for enhanced oil recovery. So the effect is actually negative of carbon capture sequestration. It should be below the line. Um, that was more, okay, now let's compare that to what, oh, and this is the, I'm sorry, I'm just showing the International Energy Agency projections, the IEA. And these are projections from um, what are called um, integrated assessment models that kind of couple some rudimentary atmospheric stuff with, uh, with economics. Um, so they also do, oh, and all of these projections are and perhaps a little bit optimistic because they're usually set to like keep us to the two degree or 1.5 degree um, limit. Um, so here's what they get for solar. So what I've plotted here is just sort of a calculation of how much uh, CO2 emissions are abated by, by building solar and replacing fossil fuels. And what you see is that they are also historically wrong um, in the opposite direction until recently when they kind of seem to get with the program and kind of extrapolate reality. Um, the point I want to make here is that I have no problem with projections being wrong. I mean, certainly all of our projections are wrong. But you do have to wonder when you're wrong in the same direction over and over again whether there might be some bias in the projections. But uh, anyway. Um, OK, so why, why could there be a bias? Uh, I don't know for sure. Um, but I think the projections way underestimate the cost of, of carbon capture and sequestration. And part of the reason for that is that we don't have any projects that are really carbon capture and sequestration that have ever worked, right? They, a lot have been built, billions of dollars have gone into them, and they've all failed in the sense that they're shut down or they just weren't even completed. So we could go through a whole list of those, but uh, some of them are quite massive, you know, billions of dollars spent on the infrastructure for this and then it's demolished before it's turned down. And the reason is, is, is that the, after it's built, you realize what the expense is going to be on people's electric bills if you actually turn it on, right? Because you have to use a huge amount of energy. Um, you have to take it away from your power plant so you have less energy. You have to build another power plant to, to power the whole thing. Uh, of course, rapid drop in renewable costs. Um, and yeah, I don't really need to say much more about that. Let me. Okay, so um, how am I doing on time? I'm doing all right. Yeah, you've been fine. I'll do great. Okay. 3:22. You've been fine, Tom. Yeah, yeah. So I'm actually, I think, ahead. Okay. Good. Slow down. <laughs> 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 okay. So the last thing I want to talk about is uh, is sort of the uh, the promotion of this uh, largely in in the in the academic literature, but there's certainly plenty of of groups out there um, who, who you know, strongly promote this as well. And I thought the fair way to do this is to pick on my own university. Uh, and you know, there's, a, there's a whole lot of papers out there, but I pulled one out just to sort of show you how this works. So this is a paper, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this at the end, that sort of the, the, the optimism has shifted, I would say, among people who are even a little bit reasonable, from power production to what's called hard to abate sectors. In other words, very expensive places to abate. Um, and they're arguing that we need a lot of this and we're going to get a lot of this. Um, and sort of a subtle thing, it's always, you, you've seen these papers, is we need subsidies. We don't need, sub, we don't need a carbon tax. We don't need subsidies for emissions reduced. We need targeted subsidies specific to carbon capture and sequestration. Um, and then conclude that it's you know, a large part of the portfolio of solutions that, that we have to build. Um, one funny thing about this one is sort of like, I can't believe they're saying this, is we use the APA, that's their integrated assessment model, the APA model to explore the potential for industrial CCS in different parts of the world under the assumptions that CCS is the only mitigation option for deep greenhouse gas emissions, which is kind of an admission that the result was, because <laughs> that, that's the main result, is that you need a lot of carbon capture and sequestration. OK, so um, what's going on with this paper? Uh, I think it's important to point out um, that one of the authors is an Exxon researcher. Um, the study itself is funded by Exxon, as are the groups um, that, um, 
that it's done through. Um, and then kind of remarkably, I don't even know what this means. It's an academic, you know, peer-reviewed journal article. It's copyrighted by Axon. So I don't know if I'm, can I show this? I don't know. But <laughs> I don't know what that means. But <laughs> Axon copyrighted the whole article. Um, so is there a conflict of interest? So if we look at that, uh, I'd say Exxon does not have a conflict. Um, CCS is good for them because it funds oil production. Um, it funds natural gas production. And I haven't said much about this other than, you know, this is where the expense of it is, is that CCS invokes or uh, involves this huge energy penalty. Right? It takes, takes a lot of energy to run it. That effectively increases the market for fossil fuels to uh, uh, the market to sell fossil fuels. Um, another point, uh, maybe a little subtle, I don't think uh, is, is out in the literature so much, but I think is very important, is that for a lot of industries, it locks in fossil fuel use, right? Because you can't get these subsidies if you find some clever way to reduce emissions from, say, steel production. You have to produce CO2 to get the subsidies, right? So it tilts the playing field towards this method that produces the, um, produces the CO2. Um, remarkably, you know, there's been a, a history of huge subsidies for projects that aren't ever turned on. Um, and then um, it's, as you know, we saw in that Exxon ad, and there's lots of those, it's now a big um, uh, part of the public relations push. Um, my observation, and I think there's statistics to bear this out, is that fossil fuel companies have kind of shifted away from denying climate change. And this is perhaps the biggest shift, uh, biggest focus of their new, new uh, promotion and, and publicity work. Okay, so Exxon is all aligned there. What about the author's interest? Well, the authors would like to um, help find solutions to climate change to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but on the other hand, uh, the authors are funded by Exxon. The study is funded by Exxon. One author works for Exxon, and the pa paper is copyrighted by Exxon, which I still don't know what that means. <laughs> So um, let me uh, actually kind of, oh, oh, let me point out something. So, okay, so I'm arguing that there is a conflict of interest here. Uh, I was kind of surprised to find out that they have a conflict of interest statement in the paper. <laughs> the authors declare that they have no known competing financial interests or personal relationships. And working for Exxon is, is a business relationship. So that could have appeared to influence the work reported in this paper. So there's no conflict. An interesting thing is sort of what does conflict of interest mean in, in academic papers. Um, and and the, that's an interesting kind of legal uh, uh, political science kind of question that uh, would be fun to talk more about. Okay, so actually um, I'm doing well on time. I want to kind of conclude uh, with saying there's, there's, I think there's arguments out there against us. Um, I don't hear them a lot. When I say us, I mean uh, me and um, some co-authors on editorials. That, well, one editorial and some we've been working on on this, this topic. Um, and what I think is the major sort of counter-argument, um, although I could give you some other ones to, to everything that I just said, is that um, there's a philosophical difference between what I'm saying and this other school of thought, which is kind of the all of the above school of thought. And, and it's often given in this uh, uh, serious concern about climate change kind of language, that climate change is a terrible, serious problem that we cannot afford to leave any tool unused for. We have to use every tool in the chest. We have to do all of the above. And the criticism then of us is we're saying, no, we, we prefer, I don't know, because we're environmentalists or something, we prefer um, renewable, renewable energy. 
I, I don't think it's a philosophical difference. I actually think this is my, my, my sort of arguments here are more economic and, and engineering. After all, uh, started a company to do it because we, we hope we thought it was a good idea then. So one way I thought to show this is um, sort of here's all of the above. And I want to argue, first of all, that there's parts of what could be in all of the above that really aren't in all of the above, because they actually make matters worse. So that's not part of all of the above. And that's certainly where carbon capture and sequestration, not just with enhanced oil recovery. Um, let me say a little bit about that. In every case you can find, the money required to do carbon capture and sequestration would abate a lot more CO2 if put into other areas, right? So if you spend $180 per ton, or you get $180 per ton subsidy to do it, if that $180 were used for other abatement options, which cost some of them <laughs> pretty much zero to abate carbon, you would abate a lot more carbon, and you would prevent all of that carbon dioxide from being in the atmosphere for not just the next decades, but the next millennium. Right? So it does, CCS doesn't belong in all the above, not only because it's producing oil and natural gas, but it actually, the net effect is to increase carbon dioxide in the, in the atmosphere. Um, then there are things uh, which uh, could conceivably work, um, but they, for the argument I just gave, aren't the best, the best idea. Right, so the argument I just gave basically applies to these. It would work, but it's not, you know, you have this big opportunity cost. Um, and then that leaves you with still an all of the above, but it's the all of the above that we know um, uh, can actually, actually have a positive effect on um, greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. So I will stop there. We, we have plenty of time for questions, and we just ask that you use the microphone because we are filming this and we want to have the questions clear. Do you think doing away with the personal car would be a good idea? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, I think as far as emissions from transportation, uh, the, the answer is, uh, uh, without even going that far, is that electric, electrification works. Um, and so electrification with renewable energy uh, is a very, I think, politically practical and economically practical way that, to really My cut. question was about doing away with the personal car. Yeah, it's a personal car. It's sort of a personal decision. I'm not going to tell someone else to get rid of their car. Personally, I'm happy without a car. It's a good idea, but I, I'm not, you know, if I were to stand, you know, give this lecture and tell, you know, people I want to take away their cars, you know, you get, this is actually the, the argument that the uh, conservatives are using in England now, is that the uh, don't vote liberal party because they're going to take away your cars. So I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to fall into that, uh, into that sort of categorization. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, I'm curious about the accounting system for the subsidies. Mm -hmm. So who counts yeah. how much CO2 is stored and is it reliable? I'm, so the answer to that is I'm very curious too. The way it's done right now is through the Treasury Department. Okay? And the oil companies or whoever does it, they just report how much CO2 they take in. Okay? There's no monitoring and there's no monitoring of it as it cycles through enhanced oil recovery. Right? Okay. So there's no monitoring of how much is left in the ground. And the frustrating thing on figuring this out is that you can't find out who's giving the subsidies. So the Treasury Department doesn't tell you who's getting the 45 QSOP. So it's very different than renewables. So you can no find public accounting. No. But we do know from a, uh, one of these, um, what's it called, the law um, that lets you get information from the government. A, uh, freedom of, yeah. That um, two or three years ago, they were, I forget the exact number, but it was a billion and something. 
Um, that was before the subsidies increased, but we have no idea who that went to, although I think I can tell you <laughs> where a lot of it goes. Yeah. But I would love to know. I assume other countries have the same program. I don't know as much about, about other countries, but yeah. So my question has to do sort of with the policy picture right now. I mean, is there any recognition of some of the issues that you've talked about? Are, is there any legislation being proposed at the federal or state level? Or is this just continuing without any recognition by the federal government? Yeah, I haven't seen any recognition from the federal government. Um, I think, and I'm speculating here a little bit, is that you know it's widely reported that this was a large part of what got Joe Manchin to vote for the Inflation Reduction Act, which of course we wouldn't have if he didn't vote for it. And it is a tremendously good thing for the whole world, right? So there's a lot of I, it's a sort of suspicion. People might think a bit like me, like yeah, this is really bad, we need to take care of this, but not the Inflation Reduction Act is still a good thing, for sure, by a lot. Um, so I think that's there, and then you know, I would guess people are a little bit hesitant to be too critical of this, um, because you don't want to lose that. Uh, uh. But on the other hand, I don't know, it's entirely possible that very few people high up, politicians, uh, understand like what I just told you. And I've noticed recently there's sort of a rift between John Kerry and Al Gore on this. Al Gore made actually a really nice one of his videos, and I, you know, he does a better job than me at saying a lot of the same things, whereas John Kerry is still very much in the, in the camp of direct air capture. Yeah. Um, thanks for the presentation. So you mentioned that a couple of uh, th there are lo loads of these papers online, uh, online that are published which have all these conflicts of interest, even though they explicitly state that they don't have these conflicts of interest. Um, it sounded like that was a good journal in which the work was published in. So uh, do you think that in some respects the journals themselves are not fulfilling their roles? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I don't know how many papers. Uh, yeah, I have, it, it'd be a lot of work to count and see. I, I don't know that a lot are so upfront about it as, as this paper, but yeah. yeah thank you, very nice talk. Uh, <clears throat> in the utilization section, you mentioned enhanced oil recovery is the main utilization part of CO2, but there are a lot of technologies that are coming up for making fuel maybe out of it, yeah. plastics. So there is DAC, direct air capture. People, companies do it. They have no idea what they want to do with the CO2. And then there is another component which adds on, right, utilizing it. So do you think this is also a solution for the large scale producing oil again, putting into the jets again, DAC? No, jet? no, def definitely not. Um, yeah, so it's you know, a huge amount of energy to get it out of the atmosphere. Um, and then the reason why CO2 is the byproduct of hydrocarbon burning is that it's very low energy, you know. It's been, you know, it's been, well, we don't, people here can do the chemistry better than me. To get it, make it back into the same fuel, second law, right? It's gonna take an enormous amount of energy to do that. Let's say you had the energy to capture it and do this right now. If you use that energy instead to stop burning fossil fuels, um, Basically, problem solved. You know, um, and I. One thing that would be fun to. Like, I've recently done a whole bunch of calculations, sort of looking at the cost of direct air capture. Um, two that uh, simple ones. One is that it would you wouldn't be paying this, but the subsidies that you're paying out of your taxes for it would amount to eight dollars on every gallon of gasoline, right? So that would be a three equivalent in a sense to a three hundred percent carbon tax. Um, it would be about $25,000 a year if you wanted to pay for direct air capture to get the average American um, uh, uh, carbon footprint. Um, if we wanted to get rid of all of our emissions with direct air capture, I think it's five times the national defense budget to do that. So, 
no, I don't think, I don't think it's a good idea. Can I uh, get you to say a little bit more about universities and the role of universities? Charlie and I were both uh, part of a BBC special that came out, what, April of a uh, year ago. Yeah, which is really good. It, it is point. really good to take a look at. Charlie is better than me. Oh, anyway, yeah. <laughs> we, we, we were both critical in there of uh, university researchers taking funding and, and the bias that comes with that. But the, the series didn't deal with and we didn't address what the solution is. Though. And you, mm -hmm. you were critical of one paper coming out of your university. Yeah. What, what's your thought as to what we really should do to solve it? other than just draw attention to it. Should there be any, should universities take proactive steps or do we just recognize it as an issue? Yeah, I, I don't have a very wise answer to that. Um, I, I am hesitant to tell anyone that they can't take research money from, you know, obviously, you know, there's exceptions, but I'm, I'm hesitant to go that far. But I think we're not even close to having to confront that. Um, there's a tremendous amount of, of effort by the administration at usually the prestigious universities, because that's where the oil companies give the most, to attract this money. So I think we should stop doing that. Um, and then um, I also think that we should acknowledge, I mean, obviously we should acknowledge conflicts of interest, um, just like we do with like pharmaceutical research. Um, and what else, what else would I do? Um, yeah, I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's a bit of a hard one. Um, I would want to sort of change the culture. Um, I don't know how to do this, but, you know, I can tell you at MIT, and it's actually a really great sort of uh, political science paper that came out of Columbia showing this. At MIT, the administration's, sanctioned you know, web page promotion stuff, actually has more positive statements in it about fossil fuels than it does about renewables. Um, we're the worst of, of the universe. I don't remember Cornell was in there. Uh, Columbia and Stanford are just below us. And then you get to the universities that don't have fossil fuel money, and they're just much, you know, much more positive press. Um, so I don't think we should do that kind of thing. You know, so at MIT, the Energy Initiative, you know, we've got a big office that, that does that kind of, they call it outreach. Um, I, I think that should shift. I, I think it's a great answer. I, I'm an alumnus of MIT, and I agree, MIT is among the worst universities. Cornell's better in this regard. Yeah, okay. I think we can all do better. <laughs> well, I love your lake heat source thing and your, yeah. <laughs> Following up, do you think there's room for like an analogy of the student movement to divest, you know, universities divest in fossil carbon uh, companies yeah, yeah, to yeah. divest in research funding by these Yeah, companies? there's a word for that, um, not divest. Princeton students really push for this and, and got it. It's called, not divest, but it's like, something, something else begins with a D, you know, it's I'm destruction, disintegration, I don't know, but they, they, they and, and uh, what Princeton did is some committee went through on a case by case, and the thing they did that's really powerful is they put Exxon on the no list. Um, but I, I don't know of any other any other universities. Maybe you know universities that don't get much money will do that, but uh, it, it'll it won't happen at MIT unless there's a revolution. So, yeah. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, so you're showing here where some carbon capture could be uh, sort of like. Makes sense, cool. No. Even though it's not the worst. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I have it like uh, I, I should I should put this out there, but but you know there there might be. Um, so that's kind of yeah. leading to my question. Like, in what kind of scenario do you think any sort of pulling carbon uh, that yeah. side actually makes sense? Okay, so this doesn't make sense, even though it's in this intermediate group. But the reason it doesn't make sense is because of how expensive it is. It would still be a net sink of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. It's just that if you used all the money for this, you could have done much more with it. It actually has a lot of other problems, but I wouldn't want to absolutely argue that this would increase climate change. I actually kind of think it would, but it's a complicated thing. So I put it, put it in that category. So what could conceivably make sense? So only some really small sort of bespoke things you can come up with. 
the one that, that I wonder about a little bit is, and I was talking to someone about this today, is um, jet fuel. Um, maybe, maybe producing jet fuel um, in the end, once we've done everything else, uh, would, would be a good idea. But it, it's not a good idea. I, I mean, I'm optimistic, but it's not going to be a good idea for at least 25 years because we have that much that we can do much more efficiently. And if we do it now, the net effect is we end up with more CO2 in the, in the air. I mean, unless, okay, unless we like have nuclear fusion and we have unlimited energy, then we can, you know, free energy, then, then we could do it. Why don't we take one more question? Thanks for the talk. Uh, I was wondering if, uh, is there any initiative uh, to make a framework for project evaluation, uh, you know, based on the actual net effect on the atmosphere, so that uh, if it's promoted enough, it could easily strike down the projects that use misleading computations to justify it? No, I mean, no, no government. Do you right. think it's necessary to develop? Oh, it'd be great, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. There's people, uh, uh, people thinking about that, but you know, I don't. No, no real government agency has taken that on. With certainly not without any authority. No ag agency has any authority to actually stop a project. Yeah. Why don't we stop there? I'd like to just uh, thank the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering here, who's paying for Charlie's travel. Urge <laughs> you to come tomorrow to the. Uh, talk in the biogeochemistry program? Totally upbeat talk. I, I show you <laughs> pictures of cool animals in Borneo. And I also want to uh, thank the Atkinson Center for providing the video services and the IT support as well as the room. So thanks for coming, Charlie. <laughs>